What's up everybody? I'm making another video. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to make some money in real estate, buying, investing, whatever the hell you wanna call it, it's all the same crap. Don't change your Twitter profile or your LinkedIn profile to become an investor right off the bat because this is gonna be one single method that you can use to make some quick money. And when I talk about quick money, I'm talking about maybe a year, maybe it could be a few months, it could take two years depending on what your plan is, but it could deposit at least five or six digits into your bank account. So if that interests you and you don't wanna hang on to real estate and think, oh, I got 25 rentals, but you know, you really don't have anything going on because you're only making a few hundred dollars off each one. You want the money in your bank is what I'm trying to say. And uh, that's what really I'm about. I've been in real estate for the past five years. I was an agent, I've been an investor, I've done some weird stuff with real estate to make money, and now I have a real estate brokerage, which to be honest with you is pretty cool to say. The real money comes from investing and doing things in real estate, so I wanted to share this with you. This is an example of a crappy condo that I bought up in Northern Virginia, which is a super competitive market. So trust me, if I can do it in Northern Virginia, you can do it pretty much anywhere in the nation. Or probably the world. I think the concept applies throughout the whole world. Buy low, sell high <laughs> and renovate. That's the moral of the story. You're going to have questions and my role as a content creator or a YouTuber is for you to ask me those questions since I'm trying to teach you the content. I've made money doing it. So many people have made money doing it. Some of the big people that you may know, meet Kevin Graham stuff and have made money doing it. This is just going to be more of a simplified version, not to understate it because I'm going to share a lot more in-depth details in it, but I'm just going to keep things simple. Last thing I'll say before we get right into the step-by-step -step process is that I can't oversimplify this process. It is not easy, okay? There's a lots of learning. There's lots of struggling that you're going to have to go through, finding a way to get money. It's not like 50 grand is just going to pop into your bank account. <laughs> it doesn't work like that, although I wish it did. Uh, but think about it. I mean, the good news is, is although there's a lot of people wanting to learn how to do this kind of stuff, not many people can actually do it. So if you can stand above those people just by your natural hard working worth that work ethic worth ethic take the extra hours the extra weekends to learn what you're looking for and the time to go tour some houses and find a good deal i guarantee you just by those simple things you're going to end up making way more money than most of the people surrounding you okay so let's jump right into this video let's do it Start the video. I think it's working. That's my bad pun of jumping right into the video. Step number one, how do you buy a house? Because obviously you're gonna have to acquire property. It's super simple. First things first, you get pre-qualified. Now I know that's super simple to say. Some tips on that, some rules you have to follow is you have to get pre-qualified by a local lender. Don't go to the, none of those lending tree websites. You need a local lender because when a deal pops up, and it will, you need to be able to close on it very fast and have your all of your stuff underwritten, have all of your things so that you look like a perfect buyer, a shiny little gold object to the seller. Because if you're trying to buy a property below low market value, you need to be able to get the seller that money fast. Now, the question is, you know, when you're getting pre-qualified is, you know, oh, I don't know how much I'll qualify for. It doesn't matter. If you work a W-2 job or have at least two years of 1099 income being self-employed, then you will qualify for something. And if that something is enough to qualify you for a property in the area that you live in, then you're good to go, then you can do this process. So that's step number one, is to get pre-qualified. Now, you're gonna say, oh, they're gonna run my credit. Yeah, but it lasts for 90 days, so it doesn't matter. Now, you're gonna say, oh, what type of loan can I get? It doesn't matter. Preferably, you would want to get the one with the lowest amount of down payment possible, so, wait for it, you can preserve your funds to renovate the property and increase the property's value. So FHA loans, you know, VA loans, VHDA loans, which is basically 100% finance. You can do all that stuff. It doesn't matter. The point is you just need to be qualified, okay? Keep in mind, you do have to move into the property. It's not like you're gonna be buying a property with a government back loan and then not moving into it because that would be mortgage fraud. And I'm not telling you to do mortgage fraud. That would be terrible. A property is worth 300,000. You buy it for 250,000. You put three and a half percent down getting an FHA loan and then you renovate the property to increase the property's value from 250 to 300. Now you might say, how the heck am I gonna find a property worth 300 for 250,000? No seller is just gonna give up their property for $50,000 less. 
Well, here's where you can get creative and put the hard work in. You can find those properties on the MLS, which is the multiple listing service. It's basically what realtors use. It goes on Zillow, Redfin, and all that crap. And I'm gonna show you how. But you can find those properties on the MLS. You can find them off market. It doesn't freaking matter. The only thing that matters is that you find the property and you negotiate the deal that I'm going to explain to you throughout this video. And then we're gonna talk about the renovating part. But the rule follows, the more distressed the property is, the more crappy it is, the better the deal you're gonna get and the more equity you're gonna be able to get. And then last but least, we're gonna talk about how do you pull that equity out without paying a trillion dollars in taxes to get it deposited into your bank account because that's all we really care about at the end of the day. So how do you find the deal? Well, this is some super simple techniques that you can use. You don't even need a realtor, to be honest with you, to do this, but I would prefer you to get a realtor, especially if you're new to real estate. Hone into a neighborhood that you can afford. Now, what can you afford? Well, it's super simple. You talk to your lender, your local lender, and try to find a local lender that can teach you things as you go and isn't just gonna brush you off because they do too much business. Now, when you're finding a deal, this is what you need to do. You need to search Redfin, screw Zillow, use Redfin or HomeSnap, okay? Those are gonna give you the most accurate examples of data. And you're doing this for the research, the due diligence part. Remember, this is the part, the learning part that nobody wants to do that's going to make you the most money because anyone can do this process and not make a lot of money. But if you're gonna go through all the headache of getting pre-qualified, moving in, renovating the process, you might as well do it to maximize in your budget so that you can get five or six figures deposited into your bank account, okay? The point is, you need to do your homework. Now, what do you need to actually learn? You need to learn the market. And this isn't gonna take years to do. In fact, it should only take you an hour or two. Go on Redfin, go on HomeSnap, look at the data of the neighborhood that you want to live in, that you can find a great deal in. Here's some things you need to look for. First thing, you need to look for comps that are actively selling. If you're looking out in like, for example, there's a small town called Percival over in Northern Virginia. There's like no homes being built there. It's all farmland. Thus, there's not that many comps. There's not that many homes being rented, not that many homes being sold. So you have nothing to compare it to. You need a cul-de-sac in a city that has a lot of comps being sold, a lot of comps being rented. And when I say comps, it's basically short for comparable properties, okay? And while you're doing this, uh, you need to figure out what types of homes are in that neighborhood. Are there townhomes in there? Are they condos? Are they single families? In my instance, it was a condo community surrounded by townhomes in Sterling, Virginia. Now, Sterling is a little weird because it's got two sides to it based off the high schools and you can see I'm getting really analytical with the data because the high schools matter. The home values are affected by the high schools. So you need to learn this type of data. And I knew that this little condo community was a very rare breed because it still went to Potomac Falls High School which was very important for people that care about their school districts is what is selling faster and what is taking longer to sell. So you're gonna wanna eventually sell the property that you're gonna buy because you need to get the money deposited into your account, right? You don't wanna be sitting on the market for three months trying to sell your single family when you could have just bought a townhouse that's selling in like two days. Why? Because it's higher turnover. So find out how long it's taking these different types of homes to sell. And then look at the conditions of each home that is selling and find out what they look like. Are the renovated homes selling faster or are the unrenovated homes selling faster? Obviously the renovated homes are probably gonna sell faster. Everyone wants gray walls and the white cabinets, okay? That's the kind of data that you need to look at and learn in the neighborhood that you want to buy a property in. And the last thing I'll say, because this can't be understated, and I have to say it to everyone, it might be super basic, but buy a home that's within your price range, okay? Preferably below your means, your living means. So if you qualify for a $300,000 property, you need to be looking at properties for like 250,000. So you can save a few hundred dollars off your mortgage. Now, once you've researched and really done your due diligence and you understand, then you know you can go in and easily buy either a townhouse or a condo at a decent deal. Now, what qualifies it to be a decent deal? You need to have a spread of at least 50 to 100,000 for you to even want to go acquire the property. Now, the reason the spread is so broad, and I'm telling you 50 to 100,000, like which one is it? It could be 70. Don't get confused. The higher the value of the home is, so if you're buying a $400,000 home, you would want to acquire that property the low threes or 300 preferably, but that would be extremely hard to do depending on what market you're in. The lower the property is worth, so like a $250,000 condo, it's gonna be very difficult to find a deal for 150,000. More realistically, you're gonna find a deal for like 200K. 
follow my drift so far, it's not super complicated. That comes with you knowing that neighborhood. And again, you're only focusing on one or two neighborhoods. You're not focusing on the whole city. Now let me paint a picture for you of the condo that I purchased in this Sterling, Virginia community that I thought was a decent deal, but has quickly made me upwards of $50,000 already. So super simple. I did the exact same thing that I just told you to do. I researched the neighborhood. I knew that this area, and I'll probably just do some screen overs here. I knew that this area had a very good high school and it was undervalued. There was new commercial buildings coming in the area. And when I say commercial buildings, I don't mean like office buildings. I mean like there was actually like restaurants, Starbucks coming in. So I knew that the property's value was going to go up. I found this condo. It was for two 265 I just put an offer in at 255 getting all my closing costs covered now for those of you that are new to real estate closing cost what does that mean it's taxes insurance uh, prepaids of those things attorney fees uh, all that other BS or crap that you don't want to pay for because it doesn't go towards the equity of the house it doesn't go towards your wealth you can especially as a first time home buyer using an FHA loan like I just told you and stop putting 10 or 20 percent down To get a conventional loan just because you're saving on mortgage insurance, oh, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. Get a government-backed loan because now you have more leeway to negotiate with sellers. 255 offer, uh, or 250 offer, I think I wrote it at, and I got all my closing costs covered, which I put 3% in there because roughly a buyer is going to have to pay 3%. They countered it like 260. I basically just went up to 255, met them in the middle, got all my closing costs covered. Bam, I bought the property at 255. Now, when I was looking at the comps, a lot of them were selling for like 290, 295, but none of them were really renovated. Now, if I could go back and find a property that had worse damage to it, I probably would have made a lower offer and I probably would have made more money renovating it because replacing carpet is really not that hard. Basically what I did is I just put granite in there, I put a nice little sink in it, nice little sink faucet, painted the cabinets, I put engineered hardwood on the main level, kept a brand new carpet, and then I just painted the whole house light gray. And I renovated the master bath, but you don't really have to do that to apply to this property. All in all, I spent around like, I think it was like 7,500 or 10,000, not including the master bath, which again, you don't really have to do all that. There's cheap ways to renovate master bathrooms. For example, you could just paint the cabinets really not that hard that's like a few hundred bucks plus material and i increased the property's value by spending ten thousand all the way from 255 what i bought it at to 290 or 295. now here's how you make the money right so you've renovated the property you moved into the property you need to move into the property especially if you're buying it as a primary residence you have two options once you move into the property you can sit there and you can wait for two years now why would you want to wait for two years because it's your primary residence once you turn around to sell that property you will have to pay capital gains tax if you don't live in there for two out of the last five years check with an accountant don't take my word for anything i'm saying in this video I'm not a tax accountant but that's pretty much the guideline of not paying taxes. The risk return is, well, the market could crash. Is it really realistically? Probably not in two years, but you never know. Coronavirus is crazy. People are dying. You don't know if it's going to crash or not. Now, you could live there for one year, pay, tax, pay uh, less capital gains taxes since you didn't live in there for the past two out of five years. You could live there for two months, turn around and sell it and do the exact same process. Take your proceeds, buy another property. It doesn't freaking matter. Okay, the point is that you need to find something below market value and you need to add the value to it, which is basic updates, granite, few thousand dollars, not that big of a deal, which is why you need a low down payment because you wanna keep all the cash you can. Now, if you're asking me, I don't have any cash. Well, do you have credit? If you don't have credit, you need to watch some of my other credit videos because you could easily apply for a credit card to pull cash out to do this. Now, am I recommending you to do cash advance? No, but I'm trying to make the point that, that this is not that hard to do, okay? Anyone can do it. And if the numbers make sense, paying that cash advance fee to renovate the property and then you're gonna sell it in six months and make double your money back, why would you not do that? So I turned three and a half percent of a down payment into $50,000. That's insane. Most people can't even make $50,000 a year. They're struggling working full time. And I did that 
over the course of basically one month in buying and renovating that property. Now here's the catch, because this is what nobody tells you. That money is invisible until you sell the property. So how do you sell the property and keep the most money back? So now we come to the last part of this process, which is selling the property so that you can cash in your equity, your hard earned work over the last three months. Now, a few things that I wanna say is you don't need a real estate agent to sell real estate. It's not illegal to sell it yourself. However, there are certain ways that you have to do and you have to be very particular about it so that you can save the most commission and not pay a five, a six, or even a 4% commission rate. That's outrageous. Right now, nowadays, you can offer a buyer agent to bring you a buyer paying full price for your property with as little as two and a half percent. And that's really not that much money when you're talking about 250 or $300,000 plus your closing costs, which might be another percent at most for a seller, get a flat fee listing service. Someone to just pay uh, that you can pay like $99 with, you can Google this flat fee listing and they will upload it in the MLS for you. All the contact from the agents will be going to you. So that way you can save more money. Now, if you're not comfortable doing this, you can still put the house on the market and pay those fees and you'll still make a profit. It just will take up and eat more of the money that should be going in your pocket. So first things first, get a flat fee listing uh, price. Look at the comparable properties and price it below everyone else that is renovated. So if you see renovated properties, uh, in my instance, selling for like 313, 305, I would easily price my home fully decked out for 299 and it would watch it get bid up. The second thing you wanna do is you're gonna get a lot of offers, a lot of showings. You need to make sure that the house smells and looks correct. I know this is a little bit weird to say, but you need to make sure your house appeals to the mass. So if it smells like a certain type of food or if it looks a certain way, uh, you want to declutter your house and depersonalize your house so that you can appeal to the mass so that you can get the most offers in. Again, it doesn't matter what the offers come in at. Ultimately, you just want to get a lot of offers in so that you can go back to them and tell them, hey, what's your highest and best? Literally, all you do is reply to the people in an email. Please have your clients submit the highest and best offer they can. Anyone can do this. You don't need to have a real estate license to be able to send someone an email and they'll keep sending their highest and best offer until it keeps getting bid up. And you can tell people you have multiple offers and it'll create a sense of urgency for the buyers. And then the final thing you do is just leave it on the market no matter how many offers you get, full price or not, for at least three to four days. This is gonna weed out the weak-handed people that aren't serious about keeping their offer on the table. And who knows, maybe you get a buyer that says, hey, if you wrap it up today, I'll offer $10,000 above your asking price. That's a no-brainer. Wrap it up and you're good to go. So, in a nutshell, you've taken to review all the steps because this is probably a pretty long video. You've taken a property that you purchased for 3.5% down. You've almost quadrupled or tripled your money by putting a few thousand dollars more into the property. And again, you don't have to go all out on the renovations. Look at the comparable properties. Look at the ones that are selling for the most money and mimic their exact updates, except keep it modern. Paint the walls gray, keep it neutral, paint the cabinets white. That's still in right now and you don't have to worry about that going away for the next few years. But look at the comps, look at your appraisal as well and make sure where you're getting undercut on values versus the other properties, you can see where you want to add or improve things. So I saw that improving the master bathroom in this condo was gonna be a huge value incentive. So it was well worth the money. I knew I was gonna get a return back on it. There's a strategy behind everything. You just gotta do the research, do the due diligence and you can easily pocket that money. Now you could take that money, put it in a 1031 one exchange and move on to another property and duplicate the process. I know people that buy houses every two years doing this and they're okay with moving that much. Then keep the house for longer. It doesn't really matter. It's up to you. That's the beauty of it. Even if you want to pay the capital gains taxes because you got a really good deal and you want to quote unquote flip the property over the course of like a year or so, it's not that bad of a deal anyway. Most people would work a W-2 job making 50 to 60,000 a year and you could do this on the side and every year or two make an additional 50 to $60,000 just by flipping the property. And eventually if you keep doing this over and over and over, you're gonna roll a lot of equity into your bank account. So that's pretty much the gist of the video. If you have any questions about the process or about who I am, Leave it down in the, uh, the, what is that called? The comments down below. I'm Austin Harley and I am done with this video. Thank you so much.